Okay, thank you very much. And Mary, yes, thank you for uh, the piano. And, uh, you know, we have the privilege of having Phil Parsons down at Bethany today, and his hearty voice is leading us in music and singing in our morning meeting. As a matter of fact, uh, I was in my car across the street, zoomed in my own meeting while you folks were having your meeting here. I was there over there dressed up like this. I felt like I was a CIA agent. I had my computer, I had the Zoom going, I had my wireless, you know, uh, you know, hotspot going on in the car right there. So it felt really like an FBI agent or something like that, but uh, it was great. I could hear, I could hear Phil's voice, probably didn't even need the Zoom. I could hear it all the way from uh, Silverton. Okay, let me just uh, take a moment here and uh, share my screen with you. Do that. Give me one second. And let's get this going here and that going here. And that going there. Now, one of those faces that you just saw in my, as I was getting ready to share my screen, was Rich Christian, who is here with his wife, Lynn. And if you have had the opportunity to see some of the uh, advertisements for the programs during the summer at Ocean Grove, I'm sure you have. You would have seen Rich's uh, name there all along uh, on that schedule. And so, you know, when I walked in, I heard that you're going to have a meeting there tonight. I was thrilled because we start our conference at Ocean Grove uh, this week, tonight, this afternoon, actually. We call it Devotion at the Ocean. And uh, we always like to ring it at. And uh, we have about 33 people coming in for the week. So uh, Fifth Avenue Chapel, you start with a core group of 30 some people this this, uh, this evening at seven o'clock. Hopefully, uh, you'll have all those seven people show up. We have people coming from South Carolina and from other places. And so we'll be there all week long to enjoy fellowship with one another. And we're looking forward to that. During the course of the week, of course, we have this Fifth Avenue Chapel tonight at the pavilion uh, at the boardwalk. And then next Sunday, as you saw, we have uh, that 3.30 program. And Jerry and Rich, of course, are involved with that as well. So we hope that you can clear your schedule and make uh, opportunity to take advantage of those uh, gospel opportunities as well as ministry opportunities there at the board wall. Let's turn our Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 4 for the beginning of our message and our series uh, for this month. So glad to be here at Belmar and really appreciate all the saints here very, very much. And uh, as was already mentioned, uh, this will be the first of five messages that will be given. And the theme of the message is living in the last days, living in the last days. And we're going to use as a uh, jumping off point, 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 7, for our uh, message and our series this month. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be sober or serious and be watchful in your prayers. And above all things, above, have fervent love one for another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory <laughs> and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. And God will certainly bless 
the ministry of his word. It says in Isaiah chapter 5, it'll go forth, it'll accomplish that which he pleases, it won't come back void. You know, those words at the very end, as to a faithful creator. When we look at the word of God and we think of God's work in our hearts and lives and of course this world and in the lives of people who turn to him and trust him, he is a faithful creator. What I'd like to focus on in our meetings this month is faithfulness to the Lord. Faithfulness to the Lord, especially in the days in which we're living. The question, of course, is are we living in the last days? And uh, that's a question that comes up. Anytime we see or hear that being said, you know, it's uh, very obvious that people are looking at the world condition and they see the deteriorating uh, Western culture taking place right before their very eyes, especially in the last couple of years, maybe even in the last year or two, but much less 10 years or 20 years. And they say, well, certainly the Lord has to be coming. There's no question about it. And they look at the declining culture and they say, there's just, obviously, it's just very clear that the Lord is coming. And I think that what they do is they go back to scripture in the days of Noah and realize that before the flood, the judgment of the flood, uh, the thoughts of men's heart were only evil continually. That's what it says in Genesis chapter six. And because that situation was that way, and it says in scripture, the angels uh, left their first estate. It talks about that in the book of Jude, that some strange things were taking place in the world system supernaturally, as well as amongst the, the sons of men, men come mankind that uh, the world was falling apart. So God then says, well, judgment's coming. So that's a theme that we see throughout scripture, that when things start going downhill, possibility of judgment of God is right around the corner, imminent. And so that's what we want to take a look at the last days. And we're asking the question, are we in the last days? Because I'm sure people back in the 70s thought it was the last days. And then in the 80s was the last days. And then in the 90s, and anytime there's a major change in the culture, Immediately, oh, we must be living in the last days. And so the question is, are we indeed in the last days? My answer to that question is a resounding yes. We are in the last days. And some of you might say, well, how can you say that? Well, I can say it based on the verse here in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. The writer to the book, uh, the writer to the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the epistle of the Hebrews, says that God has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And that's back 2,000 years ago. So if the question comes, are we living in the last days? The answer is absolutely, positively, we are in the last days based on Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. Because it says there, even in the very first century, that we were in the last days, meaning that Christ could come at any time. And when Paul was writing to the Thessalonian believers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, he says that they were to uh, turn to, the, they did turn to the living God. From idols, they were, they were idolaters, to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. So the strategy of the early Christians from the first century was not to try to clean up society. It was not to try to evoke uh, legislation that would make everybody be more sympathetic to the Christian message. That wasn't the strategy. That wasn't the game plan for the early Christians. The early Christians was to, their strategy was to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. They had already turned to the Lord, and that's how you come to know Christ. You turn to God. You don't turn from idols to God. You turn to God, and the idols will drop off. Then to serve the living and true God, and then wait for his son from heaven. And so Paul would also write the Philippian believer, and he said, we eagerly wait our citizenship is in heaven for which we wait for the Savior. And so the strategy of believers from the very first century is that the Lord could be coming very soon, maybe today. That was the theme. That was the message on every Christian's lip, every biblical Christian, every Christian who's rooted and grounded in the Lord. That was their message. And he could come at any moment. So therefore, we need to evangelize. We need to tell others about Christ. We need to serve the living and true God, help other Christians to be strong in the Lord, encourage and exhort one another in Christ. As a matter of fact, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, look with me at verses 8, 9, and 10. If you notice, there's a phrase there that's common to each one of those verses. What's the phrase? One another. Right? It says, 
in verse 8, above all things, have fervent love for one another. That's what's called the reciprocal command, meaning you need to be doing it toward me and I need to be doing it toward you. And whether you do it for me doesn't absolve my responsibility to do it for you. We love one another. Then it says in the next verse, verse 9, be hospitable to one another. Hospitable means to have people over your house, treat people to lunch or to dinner, whatever it might be, be hospitable to one another. That's serving the living and true God, as is having love for one another. And then it says in verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, the multifaceted grace of God. And so we are to minister to one another. And then, of course, the next verse talks about how we can minister. We can speak, we can serve, we can do all these different things. But the point of the matter is, God has set up the pattern in his word to say that all Christians, every Christian, no special class of Christians, missionaries, full-time warriors, it's not a separate class. The normal Christian life is to serve Christ with fervent heart of love for the Savior, helping one another, having love for one another, and serving one another, and ministering to one another, being hospitable to one another. And I could go on and on because there's 42 of those reciprocal commands in the New Testament. 42 one another's in the New Testament, just the New Testament. You don't find it in the Old Testament. It's a component of the New Testament Christian life that we serve one another, we help one another in the Christian life, we exhort one another, we pray for one another, all these things to strengthen the body of Christ. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what the early Christians were doing as well, especially those Thessalonians who were exhorted to wait for the sun from heaven. So are we living in the last days? The answer is absolutely, positively, we're living in the last days. But it's interesting because when you turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, you read words like this. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Well, that has a different spin to it, doesn't it? That almost infers that just before the Lord comes, things will get worse and worse and worse. And I agree with that. Just like we see in Scripture in the days of Noah or when Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah and the uh, Lord fire, brought down fire and brimstone as judgment against that city for their immorality that they were exhibiting. And so it carries with it this idea that there is a last days to the last days. If the last days started in the first century and were 21 centuries along already, things must be getting worse and worse and worse. And that's what it says in first. Timothy chapter 4, and verse 1, it says that in the latter days, men will, uh, will apostatize and they will give in to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Yikes, that doesn't sound very friendly or fun. Doctrines of demons. That society and the world at large will be influenced by satanic theology. And so there is the last days overall, but then there's the last days of the last days. That's what uh, Second Peter reminds us of. And so what we see before us then is this picture. We see the moral landscape in our country, and, and I'm not just talking our country because this thing is global. You know, I'm riding down the street one day, and I'm behind a truck, a Sherman Williams truck. Anybody know who Sherman Williams is? Right, they're the paint company, remember that? And their logo is a picture of, it's as, as if somebody took a paint can and poured it over a picture of a globe. You know, you see the paint coming over the whole globe. And their branding, their strategy is we want to cover the whole world with a message of Sherwin Williams, right? That's the picture that you see if you ever see one of their trucks or their store branding uh, logos. Well, it's not just our country anymore, because with the advent of the Internet and satellite technology and all the rest that we have before us, the whole globe is coming. And just like COVID, we're thinking, OK, well, you know, Ocean County and Monmouth County, they, they've been hit hard with COVID. Hear these things. It's not just local, because on the news, you turn off and turn on and all of a sudden you'll hear Japan is going through a major COVID is, issue or outbreak or Thailand or uh, China or whatever it may be, the whole world 
at the same time, I couldn't help but think of that verse in Revelation 3. She talks about the, uh, the, the tribulation that overcomes the whole world. Boy, it certainly did seem that way, didn't it, with COVID? Well, the whole moral landscape of the entire world, I'm, and I know I've talked to some people who've said there's no question in their minds that God is judging the world for the actions that the world is guilty of. And so uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verses 11 through 12, what I quoted to you, men's hearts only evil continually from their youth up. That's the moral landscape we're living in. Matthew chapter 24, and verse 12. I point over here, but I should be pointing up here, right? Matthew chapter 24, verse 12 says the love of many will grow cold. Iniquity will abound all around the world. Now, that's the Olivet Discourse. That has a specific reference to the tribulation period <coughs> after Christ returns for his church. But the principle is still the same. The principle is this, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, 1 John 5. He's the prince of the power of the air. He works in the sons of disobedience. This is all Ephesians 2, I'm quoting. Whether it's education or commercialism, whatever, I, it can be sports, I don't care what it is, he's got a way, the devil does, to infiltrate every segment of society and work his strategy to alienate people from the gospel of the grace of God and from hearing the message of God's love and grace in Christ. Why else would anybody reject the message that says the God of heaven, the God who created everything, loves you and wants a relationship with you and wants you in his heaven? Why would anybody ever say, I don't want that? Why would anybody ever want to say that? The God of heaven who cares for you and sent his son, he loves you and he wants you to himself. What would make them say, I don't like that message? <clears throat> well, what would make them say that is exactly what happened to Absalom there in 1 Samuel chapter 15. <clears throat> Absalom, the son of David, who sat by the gate, it says, and he listened carefully to the argument of the people, the greedy people who said, oh, I'm bringing a lawsuit because, you know, I wasn't treated fairly. And Absalom there in that first Samuel 15 passage, he sat there with an ear bent in and he listened carefully to the greed that was exhibited by those people. And he said, you know, if I was made deputy in the land, I would be fair with you and I would give you this, what you deserve. And that appealed to the greed of those people. And it says in scripture, verse six of that chapter, it says, by these means, Absalom stole the heart of the men of Israel. He listened and he spun it. He twisted the whole thing. And he said, you know, I'll treat you better than you'll ever be treated, be treated before. And that is the strategy of Satan. He does that work in the world. He says, you follow me. Now, he doesn't say it that way. But in essence, he says, you follow this path. I'll give you joy and happiness and you have you can do anything you like and the unregenerate world the world that is blinded by the God of this world second Corinthians 4 buys into it hook line and sinker you know what that phrase is right Belmar by the sea you know fishing right all you have to do is get that nice tantalizing lure in front of a fish let it go through that water, shiny and colorful. And it's like the fish can't resist. They see that lure going through the water and it's like, ah, I want that. And that's exactly what the devil does in this world. And he deceives so many. So the moral landscape is this way, not just the moral landscape, but the political landscape is this way too. Daniel chapter three, <coughs> excuse me. And I know back in April, when I gave messages, some of these things I, I highlighted, but not fully uh, brought out. But the political landscape in Daniel chapter three, just like it was in the days of Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar tried to indoctrinate these bright young Jewish upstarts like Daniel and his three associates. And Daniel and his friends were told, as with everybody else, that there was a decree that was made, and with that decree being made, you have to bow down, Nebuchadnezzar said, to the image made of me. 
government legislation compulsion to do these things contrary to their convictions, their godly convictions. And so that's Daniel. That's the political end. And that's kind of what we're going through in our country as well. You better subscribe or else, that type of thing. And so that's the political landscape. <coughs> now there's, <coughs> excuse me one second. There's also the educational landscape. And again, that's what Daniel and his friend went through, the redoctrination. You know, you got to eat the king's menu here. You got to do this. And Daniel said, well, you know, that's against my convictions. And so he stood up against it. These were the men who stood out and stood up and stood with the Lord. And uh, so they went through this whole program, but they were able to show their convictions. They were faithful to the Lord in a, in a strange land where the country presented their own platform for education and for rules and all that. And in the midst of all this, these men were faithful to the Lord and they stood up and they said, no, these are our convictions and I'm not gonna bend Balor. And they didn't burn later either. That was because they were faithful to the Lord. And that's what the essence of these messages are gonna be. The challenge to God's people to be faithful and steadfast to the Lord. Now, uh, you have your hand open, uh, hopefully, in 1 Peter chapter 4. Just go over to the next epistle, chapter 3, and look with me at the very end of that chapter, end of that epistle, chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 17. Peter is writing to these believers, and he wraps this up. Don't forget, these two epistles can be taken together. And even though they're separate, they have a consistent message. In verse 17, you therefore, beloved, he's calling these believers beloved. They are fellow believers. Since you know this beforehand, he's talking about false doctrine, false teaching, the uh, bad consequences that come about as a result of uh, following that false teaching. He says, you also beware, lest you, Christian, you, beloved, lest you fall from your own steadfastness. Be careful that you don't slip up. Be careful that you don't let things slide. That's what happens when the environment around us <clears throat> gets so dark and so difficult that it's easy for Christians to begin to compromise and let things go off in our steadfastness and so he's warning believers here he says don't fall from your own steadfastness some christians i remember even without any incentive without any prize at the end of the week you know when we have vbs we just finished our vbs we had a great time with it i see you have yours coming up in august is it beginning of august it's great to have prizes for the kids it's a motivator no question about it but sometimes I wonder, I said, now, they say the Bible verse and they get candy, okay? It's, it's a motivator. Bring your friends out, you get some candy or you get a prize or something. I know that. And it, it works in some cases. But I sometimes wonder, even for believers, are we motivated by what we will get from the Lord? Oh, Lord, I want to be faithful to you. And if I'm faithful, maybe that'll mean that, I don't know, I get a nice big house and that you know, vacation uh, in the Riviera or something. Are we, is that what's what motivating us or is it love for the Lord? Love for the Lord. And so here, Peter is exhorting these believers and saying, don't fall from your own steadfastness. Memorize the scriptures, read the word of God. Don't do it for a reward. Do it because your heart is filled with Christ and you want to be occupied with him. He says, don't be led away with the air of the wicked, but rather, verse 18, a great verse for all of us, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. It's a great verse, one that we want to keep in mind. And so there is, there is the picture that we have before us, and of course the spiritual landscape as we talked about as well all these different components in society that cause a Christian to feel like they're swimming against the current. 
We're in a day, we're living in a day where you say, I believe in the Lord, all of a sudden you feel like you're going to get attacked. What you say is, I love the Lord. What do you mean by that? So there's the moral landscape, the political landscape, the educational landscape, the spiritual landscape. Uh, as we said, the latter times, minerals, you know, fall away and give in to seducing doctrines. That's the spiritual picture that we're in. That's the political picture we're in. And Acts chapter 20, verses 27 through 30 says, I have not shunned, Paul said, to declare to you all the counsel of God, Take to take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God. This is what's going to make a believer strong is feeding on the word of God. Some of us may not be that diligent in our own personal devotion, We're waiting for someone to tell us. I mean, that's the value of having a pulpit here on a Sunday morning so that we are all being motivated to read and study the word. Question is, though, are we doing this on our own? I often love to tell this story found in Judges chapter one, where Othniel was being challenged by Caleb. And, Oth and Caleb was a fellow, you know, he was one of those spies that came into the promised land and spied out and gave a great report. He says, you know, we're well able to overcome this. With God, we're a majority. And so let's forward, move forward ahead. That was Caleb along with Joshua, only two of them. There was 12, 10, 12 spies all together, but 10 of them came back with a negative report. We can't do it. They're too big. You know, we're grasshoppers in their sight. You know the whole story. I've spoken about it here before. And so, you know, Caleb challenged this guy, Othniel, and said, listen, there's a city there by the name of Kirjath Sefer. This is in Judges chapter one. Now, Kirjath Sefer, and I've, I know I mentioned this story here before. It's a, it means the city of the book. The city of the book. It was like a Alexandria in its day. Big library city, you know, housed all these volumes, I guess, of ancient history. And Othniel captured that city. And because he captured that city, he won a great reward. One of those was the wife, or rather the daughter of Caleb. And so he was handsomely rewarded, Othniel was, because he had captured the city of the book now that's got a picture spiritually for us this is the book right here and we are meant to study to show ourselves approved rightly dividing the word of truth if there's anything you're to do you study as a christian you study this book we study the stock market we study how to do good work at our place of business to get a good evaluation. We study all sorts of things, but God says this book is life. This is where you're going to get your joy. This is where you're going to get your direction from in life. This is the book that's going to help you out when you're discouraged and depressed and everything else. Get your face in this book and it'll make all the difference in the world. They looked unto him and were radiant, Psalm 34 says, and their faces were not ashamed. To look at this book and to study this book and know this book inside out. Now, I don't know the man, Harold Sinjin, maybe I don't, others in this meeting, you know that name, right? Harold Sinjin. I was told, I think it was Paul Young from Wales told me that it was said of Harold Sinjin. His name looks like Harold St. John, in case you have your book, his books in your library. Harold Sinjin. You could quote a verse in the Bible and he could tell you where it was. I say, I find that hard to believe, but you know, there's people that can do that. Memorizing full gospel of John. So good when you talk to somebody who is filled with a word. And then we're living in a day in which uh, we hear much about spirit filled living. Well, I'll tell you what spirit filled living is, right? Ephesians chapter five says, be filled with the spirit and Psalms and uh, spiritual songs, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, be filled with the Spirit. That's how it's defined in Ephesians chapter 5. But you turn over in Colossians chapter 3, and it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So what that means, if you take that verse in Ephesians 5 and the one in Colossians chapter 3, that the Spirit-filled Christian is the Word-filled Christian. 
And if you trace it through in the book of Acts, anytime the apostles were spirit filled, they had joy in their hearts and they were being persecuted and they counted themselves, they were joyful because they counted themselves worthy to suffer shame for the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 4. So if you were lacking in joy, overcome by discouragement, disappointment when you see the world, just read this book, read this book. It's got the answers in it. And that's what Paul said, take heed and to make sure that you feed the church of God. And that's what Acts chapter 20 talks about because there'll be after my departing, he says, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Well, we wanna hurry on right here because there's a couple things I wanna point out. What does it mean to live victorious? What does it mean to live faithfully for Christ in these last days? In order to do that, there's a, an understanding that has to take place in the life of every Christian. And we're so quick to want to say, oh, Lord, what do you want me to do? We understand that, you know, in John chapter six, people said, well, what would you want me to do? He says, this is eternal life that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So some of it is just acknowledgement. And so uh, one of the things that will help us to be steadfast and faithful in the things of Christ is understanding our position in Christ. Colossians chapter three, verses one through four. If you then be risen with Christ, Paul says to these believers, seek those things which are above. Well, that's action. Seek the things that are above. What's above? Well, James tells us wisdom is from above. You know, the Lord is above. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father and high. There's lots of things that are above. There's the Lord said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe also in me and my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That's above. So you seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God and set your affection, your heart on things above, not on things on the earth. It says you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Now we're dead, we're very much alive, we look alive. Most of you look alive here in the audience, smiling. I'm alive, I'm speaking. But spiritually, you know, we've died with Christ to be risen again with him to walk in newness of life. And so that's what Colossians 3 is talking about. So how does this play out practically in our lives? Well, there are some pictures in the Old Testament that really gives a good, clear indication of how we ought to live. In Exodus chapter 12, when the nation of Israel was about to depart from Egypt, they had already been redeemed. The blood was applied on the lintels of the doorposts and they're ready to leave to go through the wilderness to the promised land. God has them on a journey. And he's gonna have a character development program while they're in the wilderness. We know that Egypt to Canaan, I've spoken that on that topic here. But they're told to put a belt on and have a staff in hand, that's what you work with, a belt so that you're not tripped up as you're walking or running or whatever, and shoes on their feet. That's the picture. Eating the Lord's Passover, just like Christians have the Lord's Supper. And they are prepared to move, to leave that country. That's the picture of the Israelites. And they're fully equipped for a successful journey. Their hands are filled with that staff to work. Their feet are shod. Christians' feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel. We have a responsibility. I appreciate the comment about the tracks and all that, the, the Ocean Grove Boardwalk and having an outreach there. I mean, it's great pictures following the same line. That's what Exodus 12 talks about. But not only just doing that, being equipped that way, but also shining for the Lord. I love this picture. You can look at it uh, on your own. It's in Judges chapter 7. It's under the ministry of Gideon. Gideon, one of the judges of Israel. And he had a company of 300 men. And he divided that company up in 100 units of 100, three units of 100 people. And he gave each one of the men in that squadron, if you call it that, trumpets. Everyone had a trumpet. 
Everyone had a pitcher and everyone had a torch inside that pitcher. Then as they were marching, moving along, the signal was given and that torch was, which was lit and in that vessel, that pitcher, which was, the torch was burning in that pitcher. When the signal was given, they were to break the pitchers and let the, the light shine out as they blew the trumpet. What a great picture for the Christian. We have a message that we trumpet out for the Lord. And we have a responsibility to shine for Christ. Let your light so shine that the world may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So when somebody cuts you off uh, on the highway, I got this from you, right? And Lois, I'm looking right at you. Yeah, I heard Rita say you coined the term COVID cranky, right? Is that right? I don't know. Maybe, maybe Rita came up with that. I don't know. But I always liked that. So he said, I remember that COVID cranky. So when people cut in front of you, I can be COVID cranky too, you know, and I don't like that. We don't, that's my place in the pavement on the highway, you know, but it's, uh, that's how the world, I mean, the road rage is pretty bad. I mean, I was just making a left-hand turn one time and uh, the guy went by me, he's yelling and giving all sorts of gestures. I, I said, what did I do? I didn't do anything. I just put my left signal on, I had my left signal. I kept saying to myself, what in the world was he thinking? I was doing everything right, but anger. This is what Ephesians chapter 2 talks about, the sons of disobedience and wrath that's there, that's indicative of the world around us. That's what we're going through. So to counter that, Christians need to shine for Christ and not be silent about it, the trumpet. Brokenness is what causes the light to shine. As soon as you start saying, I want my way, that's not brokenness. Brokenness lets the light of Christ shine out. Judges chapter 7 is a great picture of that. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 17 through 18, uh, they were, the workers were there. They had a sword by their side. They had a trowel in their hand, and they were near the person who had the trumpet. They're working. They're waiting. They're watching. That's the position of the Christian, our position in Christ. But there's more. Because it says that we've been raised with Christ. And raised with Christ is pictured all throughout the New Testament, or Old Testament, rather. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, I've spoken about this many times. That's the problem when you have somebody this close to your assembly. And I'm here, I forget if I use this illustration or not, but Mephibosheth is a great picture there, right? He was, he was uh, dropped by his parents early in life. He was maimed as a result. He had bad feet, bad legs, whatever it was. He couldn't walk. He was worth nothing. He couldn't work. He couldn't walk. He couldn't do anything. And David says, I want to bless someone from the house of Saul for the sake of Jonathan. Someone blessed who was unworthy, not able to work, not able to do anything for the sake of another picture. What a great gospel picture that is. This person was Mephibosheth and he was raised up and made to sit at the king's table continually, never to be taken away from that. No one ever saw his legs because they were under the table. And it's like you and me, what we've been brought into. It says in Song of Solomon 2.4, it says that he brought me into his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. It's what Christ has done for you spiritually. You can't, it's not something we do, it's something we have to realize. We have to acknowledge, we have to meditate on the word and think it through and say, this is my position in Christ. Raised up, made to sit together in heavenly places. That's what these scriptures talk about. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 11, Paul said to this group of Christians who came from a very bad situation, he says, such were some of you, but you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You know, you've been made new in Christ. And that's a wonderful thing to ponder through. 
So we're raised up with Christ. Mephibosheth, great picture, Song of Solomon there. And then these words in Ecclesiastes 36, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. That was the first thing I recognized when I had come to know the Lord Jesus as a young person of 17 years of age. I said, my heart, and I kept saying to myself, I said, I can't believe what I'm like. My heart has been changed. And whereas it had been hardened before, going along and following the course of this world, like Ephesians 2 talks about, when Christ came in, the transformation that took place softens the heart. I was at a wedding reception yesterday, and I was sitting at the table with someone who dealt with a lot of the men who come into the colony there in America's Kissing. Her name is Mary Ann. She's on the board, of course, and she has worked there for many years. But I said, you know, I, you probably have some very interesting stories. He says, I'll tell you one story. He says, there is a fellow there who was so angry, so bitter, and he was encouraged to come to trust Christ as a Savior. He kept putting it off. He said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. Angry, real angry. So the word of God kept pounding away at his heart and conscience. You know, the Jeremiah tells us, is not my word like a hammer and like a rock that breaks the, uh, the hammer that breaks the, the rock in twain in pieces. The word of God shared just the word of God. We're not talking about our eloquence, not talking about our ability to explain his Bible, just the word of God hammers away at the conscience of an individual. And this person was so angry, but the word, he was still under the sound of the word to a point that he says, no, I think that I want to trust the Lord. He was still angry. This guy who had a hardened look, a hardened face, hard words, angry. He says, you know, I want some of the guys here to pray for me. And so no mystical thing took place. He just sat in the middle of the room and these men began praying and say, I forget the fellow's name. They began praying. They say, help him understand the love and mercy and grace of God. And you know, he himself prayed. Romans 10 tells us that without, you know, uh, the confession with the mouth, you know, it has to take place with the, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. He says, I want to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Do you know he got up from that little prayer meeting that took place in the hallway of that room, and he had a smile that was beaming on his face, and it never disappeared. I tell you, the gospel of God's grace and mercy works, and you don't need a seminar, you don't need to have anything else uh, to try to change your thinking. It's the gospel of the grace of God. This guy went out in victory in his life and an absolutely changed individual instantaneously because of the gospel of the grace of God. And so he understood he was raised up in Christ, his position in Christ, raised up and made to sit together in heavenly place. What a change that took place. Marianne was telling me this yesterday, late afternoon, early evening, whatever it was. She says, now that was a miracle. I said to her, you know, you know, you have some of these great preachers, they have their stories to tell. I says, you probably have a dozen or more stories to tell just like that. You ought to put that in the book. She says, I saw so many dramatic transformations take place at the name of Christ and confession of the name of Christ. And the world out there will tell us that there's no, you know, need to have church or anything like that, right? When, when the pandemic came, you know, what was the essential services? Have the bars open, have the liquor uh, stores open, right? Churches, you can only have a little bit of 10. It's not an essential service. You gotta be kidding. After you heard a testimony like Marianne gave, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's what the word of God tells us, the change that takes place in people's lives. Well, we're going to continue this series next week. Our time is gone. But to keep in mind the responsibility to be faithful to the Lord. He has done so much for you. How can you do any less for the greatest of masters? And so we're talking about faithfulness and living for the Lord in the last days.
And we trust the Lord will speak to each one of our hearts about these important things. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we pray through your Holy Spirit that you'd speak to hearts here this morning. Whatever that need that there might be in people's lives. Maybe it's sin that needs to be judged and put away. Maybe it's uh, resentment, maybe bitterness, maybe some other thing that's blocking the way to entrance into a land of blessing and promise. So Lord, we pray that that Jericho will be taken down instantly. We pray, Father, for each one here, maybe under a cloud of discouragement, depression, whatever it might be. Pray, Lord, that you dissipate that as we look into your word, study it, see the face of Christ speaking to us through his promises in the scriptures. Thank you again for the assembly here. We pray that you speak to our hearts through your precious word so that we have the joy and thanksgiving that should characterize our lives. We give you thanks in our Savior's wonderful and precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm.